Alrighty then. Um, a few years ago, I, I, uh, somebody had the idea that I should add real-time collaboration to FontForge. Uh, FontForge is a uh, font editing and design program which is implemented in about 400,000 lines of C. Um, I've been working on FontForge and updating and fixing bugs and replacing its rendering engine and things like this over three or four years. So it was sort of given to me that uh, this would be very useful. Um, You can't hear me, or is... Yeah, it's okay for me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I used a little one. Uh, yep. Big ones for the... Uh, um, is this better, or...? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, I don't know whether I should go all the way back, or... Uh, but basically, yes, FontForge allows you to design fonts. Uh, there's a uh, workshop that is run and moves around uh, called Crafting Type. And the workshop is, brings people who are graphic artists and who know how to draw things in, but who want to actually design fonts for websites or for uh, commercial use. So they'll come in and they'll uh, learn how to use FontForge to make new fonts um, for whatever they're doing. Um, and in this environment, the people who are running it said that it would be very nice to be able to collaborate. So you could have 10 people uh, all designing a font, all using whatever laptop they had with them. And if people move the O around, or if the instructor says, you know, you can see on your screen the letter A, or the, the O and the N, which are the two, you know, base characters when you're designing a font. And they can say, if I move this, this here, here, and here, and then on their screen, you know, whatever the changes the instructor is making, they see on their copy of FontForge. So that was the, the base use case for why people wanted to have um, real-time collaboration in FontForge. And uh, I'll probably be getting ahead of myself if I keep talking about that part of it. Um, anyway, a little bit about myself. Um, I spent about 10 years writing libferris, so if anyone wants to talk about virtual file systems and doing Plan 9 type stuff on Linux, then, you know, come and see me. Um, I also play on with robots, do a bit of ODF stuff, and have worked on various open source projects like uh, FontForge, Caligra, Abbey Word, and a few others. Um, yes, this was the why, why do we want to have real-time collaboration in FontForge or any other program anyway? Surely everyone who uses GIMP or FontForge just sits in a cafe by themselves with their laptop and edits their file. Um, the workshop was one thing. Um, another thing was live live uh, previews or uh, rolling views of fonts as you're designing them. Um, if you're making a new font these days, you can find that it's being designed for people with a retina display or people with a tablet with a certain resolution. And people wanted to be able to have, here's my HTML page using the font, here's what the, the user will see on their phone when they come to our website. This is what I'm designing the font for. I don't want to have to keep exporting it to open type and then reloading it on the tablet or on the phone. It's a sort of you know, uh, complicated workflow in order to see whether a change is actually going to be effective. So with real-time collaboration, not everything in the collaboration session has to be FontForge. Um, you, know, you can have something sitting there listening and saying, great, I'll take all of the changes and put them in Git. I'll put them in a database. I'll take all of the changes and I'll make an open type font. And then I'll actually feed that through to your phone. So you just glance across at your phone. There's the latest change. You move something half a second later, your phone's showing you what the user will see. The whole exporting it to an open type and reloading and you know all of that sort of stuff just goes away. So collaboration can also be collaboration with other tools. Uh, one of the biggest goals of the design that I was coming up with was low code impact. Um, FontForge is about 400,000 lines of code. Not everyone who was working actively on FontForge was interested in collaboration. Um, there were people who were actually quite against it and they said, like, you know, we just don't want a whole bunch of calls everywhere throughout the code. So that was one of the things that I was taking into account when I was working out how I was going to try and do this. Um, almost real time, cross platform, it works on Windows, Linux, OS X. Um, and the ability for people, well, multi-tools that I've spoken about, but people to also come to a session late. So if I'm designing a font in here with one person in here, someone can walk in the room and say, great, um, let me in on that action. And just open that up, their laptop, open FontForge and join the session and be completely up to date with everything we're doing. And then they can just make changes straight away. So the design that I came up with, uh, was to 
sort of take advantage of the undo and redo stack in FontForge to get the, the change sets that are being sent to other versions of FontForge and sent around to other people in the collaboration session. Um, one of the things there that is a bit of a catch-22 is that your granularity is locked and if you have multiple small actions, um, this can clog up the undo-redo system quite a bit. By the granularity being locked, I'm sort of meaning that if you have a glyph and you're moving a Bezier node or you're modifying the line, uh, ordinarily in, a, in the undo stack, that doesn't become effective until you release the mouse. And when you release the mouse, the undo stack takes effect. So then you can control Z. Because when you're moving the Bezier around, the undo system is just sort of sitting in the background saying, I'm waiting for you to you know, tell me something that I need to save in the stack. So. I needed in that case to have specific code in there um, as you are moving Bezier curves around to actually send little undos through the system so that everyone else could actually in real time in a room like this where there's low latency, everyone could see just as you were dragging a node in real time that drag. Otherwise, you know, you have to release it and then you've released it and everyone would see it. Uh, the way undo and redo works in FontForge, basically there's a preserve call which is done at a time when an undo is, is uh, desirable. Uh, you just modify local program state at some point. Um, you snapshot the state, push that onto the redo stack, and the undo can actually read from where you called preserve to go back in time. So effectively, like most other programs would do, where you would have, um, this is a, a stable point, I'll call undo, which will clone um, state. I'll modify local program state, and if I call the same snapshot function again, uh, it will look at the previous one and sort of create a, a delta between the previous and the now. And so then you have a, a stack of undos that you can go back to uh, an empty or blank document. Uh, to handle the network stuff, um, I use 0MQ. Uh, which provides multiple ways of sending packets around, and I'd highly, highly recommend doing it. You know, socket programming is a lot of fun, and doing serial AO, it seems like a great idea until you know you do it, and then it's not. And uh, you know, packetizing things, making sure things arrive. I'm sure everyone who's written serial code knows how painful it is to write. So, good choice. I found uh, UDP broadcast code on OS X was broken. Submitted patches to 0MQ to fix that. Um, they were using 255 UDP addresses, which the version of OS X at the time just didn't like. Um, and the way in which uh, I'm tracking the, the state, there's a baseline, which is basically a full save of the font to start. And every change that you do on the undo stack um, is sequentially numbered from there forward. So if you join into a session, you know, it'll load the base font file and then just keep doing all of the changes until it's up to that point. And obviously you can, you know, create a, a later snapshot and say, like, you know, there's a thousand changes, but here's a new complete save of the font, and then we'll, we can go from there. So you don't have to spend, like, you know, five minutes having a machine run through a thousand things just to join the session. Uh, which is exactly what I've just said. Is there a dedicated server? Yes. Uh, it's about 400 lines of code. And every font forward ships with the dedicated server. Uh, so basically, if you go through the menu as a user, you don't get to know. You just say, oh, I'd like to start a server. And then it says, great, you know, what would you like to call it? You know, Dave server, whatever. And everyone can then see it. Like there are, um, there are beacons happening in the background when you create a server, so you don't have to know your IP address. This is designed to be used by people who are you know, designers rather than people who are computer geeks. They don't really care to know uh, just lost power, excellent. They don't really care to know what IP address they're running on or DNS or any of that sort of stuff. They just want to give it a nice, you know, happy name and have people join the happy name session. Um, there are four sockets on the server, a publisher, collector, a ping, which also allows you to quit the server, and a router, which basically, instead of a pub-sub model, which is the usual 0MQ model, the router allows a client to say, Hey, I'm here. Just respond only to me, but it lets it get the entire get the entire state of the server up to the point where it is. So if it joins the session, it can get the the file and all of the changes, and then just keep listening to what the um, what the publisher is saying from the server to get the new changes from there. So at any point, you can you can start from scratch. Um, 
the public, yes, the publisher just sends out all of the, the things that are being sent from the clients, any of the clients to the server. Um, the subscriber basically, yes, um, reads a packet and sends it back on the, pu the publisher and, and stores it into a hash table so that anyone who asks the router, where, give me the entire state, that hash table can, is, uh, the keys in the hash table are basically the sequence numbers of the packets. So it's an in-order hash table rather than just a hash table. And of course with the ping you can also do things like uh, ping, but by the way, uh, I'd like you to quit so that you can tell the server uh, that you're no longer needing it. The difference between the publisher and subscribe, the uh, uh, publisher and a router is basically that the router is a one-to-one -one and the publisher, everyone will get it. Whereas you're not really wanting to send the same font and everything else to 30 people just because you've got a new person joining the session. Um, the beacon stuff is sort of, there's a few low level details there which I'll probably skip over. But basically it's just a, a way in which the, uh, the server just sends out packets at intervals saying, um, you know, this is my server and I've included things like the font name in there. So if somebody, somebody's going to know the name of their font. Like if you're spending a month writing, creating a font or you're going to make a variant of a font, that's going to be the easiest way to identify your server. So you don't even necessarily need to say who you are or whatever, you just say, you know, come and join me working on, you know, funky Helvetica 5 and people are going to be able to see the, the server as that. Uh, each client, when you're actually doing a, this, this slide with the asterisks is the core of the talk basically. Um, so when you are sending out the, the changes, um, you look back at the, the, the user has made changes after uh, an undo state has been saved. So then you undo where you are, which will push your current uh, state onto the redo stack. Because basically if you undo something, then you can redo to get back where you were. So that's a way of capturing the current dirty state of the program that you're wanting to send to other clients so that they can be up to the exact point in time you're at. So you do a, an undo and the last redo is effectively what you want to send everyone. So then you call another function to send that uh, redo and on your local stack you remove that redo from your undo redo stack and delete it. So you're effectively now at that point um, back to where the user was before they made any changes. Uh, but you have sent those changes over the wire to the server and at that point if you don't get them back um, the user will basically see that you've dragged a node here and it will snap back to where it used to be. Um, a few other bits of metadata are tagged onto the message sent out, the current time, UUID, name of the font, um, and uh, <coughs> a sequence number. The reason that you get away with um, undoing and leaving it undone is that basically on each client you have another loop which keeps reading messages from the ser uh, service publisher, storing them and basically you uh, grab that message, deserialize, the undo and push it onto the redo stack and then call redo. So what you have done to send out the packet was to go undo, grab the redo and send it out and then delete the redo and what the server sent you back is the same packet which you then put onto the redo stack and then you call redo to go back and redo it. So effectively uh, from the, the machine that's making the changes point of view, it's gone back in time, it's sent the changes out to the server waited, the changes have come back, it's put them on the redo and then it's moved back forward in time to where it was. So that particular program has not changed at all. But by doing this loop of sending it out and using the undo redo stack, every other client on the actual session has got that change as well and has moved forward to where the change that you've just made is. Hopefully, you know, there's a few nods, so hopefully I haven't described it incredibly badly, but uh, And this leaves an interesting situation if the user goes to the edit undo option. Um, so I sort of thought, what happens if you do that? And I did that. And not good things happen. Um, because basically you get to point six. So you have, instead of having dirty state, you're wanting to actually 
send the, un the last undo from the stack. And if you just send that out in the same sort of way, by the time it comes back and the whole system handles the return message, you get back to exactly where you were and the user sits there and sits in control Z and nothing happens. Because every time you send it out, it comes back and you create the undo stack that's exactly the same. So you need to especially mark messages that are going out as a local uh, edit undo in order to handle them slightly differently, in which case you can move them from the undo to the redo stack forcibly. And this will work for all clients on the session as well. They get one coming out and you, you're basically flagging that this is actually, you know, this has been done from the menu rather than this has been done from the undo redo uh, collaboration code. Uh, undo it like I mean it sort of thing uh, as the flag, I suppose. So to perform a local undo or a you know uh, edit undo, uh, pop from the undo stack and send that as before with a specific flag and then just delete it. And when it comes back again, um, after you've done the redo, you then have to flick it over from the undo stack to the redo stack, in, wh in which case your, every client moves back in the undo redo um, linked lists. So you can then do another undo from the menu and just keep peeling back through the, the history of undo redo. So by using the undo redo stack with collaboration, you don't have to forfeit having the undo menu and the redo menu work for everyone. Uh, but you do need to be mindful of the fact that um, it's being called from the menu and handle those messages just slightly differently in order for it to still seamlessly work. As I sort of mentioned in the lead in, there were uh, some non UI clients. So, um, one of the things was the, the ability to have tablets so you can be designing fonts and see them on tablets as you're designing them and as you're making changes. Because on a higher resolution MacBook or something, you know, if you have a big O or a big N, it looks really nice on a big screen with you know, many, many pixels. But if you start having it on a small tablet, it might not look as good. So this sort of greatly affects the, uh, well, the way in which you're going to keep designing things. I'm not entirely sure whether people want to look over the code for um, you know, a Python collaboration client or not. Yeah. Okay, well, I, ha I have it anyway. So yes, one person has interest, excellent. Um, so if you're wanting to join a session from Python to do whatever strange things with the Python FontForge bindings, this is how you go about doing that. Um, so in this case, I open the URL and then I am uh, generating a, um, an open type in slash temp and joining the collaboration session. And basically, uh, after you've joined the collaboration session with a callback handler, you just sort of tell it, you know, keep handling every message for me. And that will effectively call the on collab update. And then on collab update, you grab the current uh, sequence, grab the message, and in this case, I'm just saying, um, for the font, I'm saying font generate uh, the font file name on disk. So every time um, a new update comes in, if you grab the O and you move it slightly higher, that's an update. This function in Python will be called by the server, basically by virtue of the server sending out a message. And this particular, um, FontForge that's being run from Python will then generate a new open type and store it to slash temp. And hopefully I haven't deleted the part there, but it will then uh, send out a WebSocket thing. So on the client side, it has a WebSocket saying, um, you know, I'll just keep listening for things. You don't have to refresh the page. As soon as something is called on that WebSocket, it says, great, there's a new font. I'll just refresh that in the actual browser. So as you move something, basically through all of these mechanisms in the background, and this can take quite a while. If you're generating an open type and you've got something with three or 4,000 glyphs or 10,000 glyphs, this might take it you know, two or three seconds. So, but that doesn't really matter because if you're sitting there and you're editing something, if it takes it that long, and um, it's not your primary machine, it's not locked, which is another great thing. Uh, someone in the collaboration session can be slow and that's really irrelevant. It doesn't stop your font forge from reacting properly. So you're, you move something around and you say, oh great, and you've still got full access to your laptop. And if the, the server in the other room is sort of sitting at 100% for half a second, then so be it. The other thing there would be if you are only interested in a handful like a subset of glyphs, you could actually tell this Python binding to drop out a thousand of them and just say, only generate an open type with 20 glyphs or with the ASCII or, you know, 
this range so you can play around and sort of have it um, more efficient if you like in the generation. And on the web watching side, basically, um, yes, it's even better. I just watch with the uh, watch the file system directly with a bit of JavaScript stuff. Um, so after I was sort of looking over how this was all happening, and obviously in the talk I've mentioned function names and things like that, and they are actually the function names. If you look at FontForge's Git page, you can find them with grep, and you can see the full gory details of how messages are made and how things are sent out rather than the, in some cases, slightly abridged version in the slides. Um, so if you're interested in doing this, um, pretty much all of the machinery is available on GitHub in FontForge to do this, um, and all the source code's there for you to see. Um, what I, looking at the size of the code and parts of it that were generic, I was thinking of actually breaking some of it out into a shared library. So the, um, like the server, the beacon handling, um, And also hooks for things like some of the, the tools, like if, um, because your application will need to be able to serialize and deserialize undos, um, that would actually need to be exposed to the library. Uh, but there'd be no reason that the library itself couldn't then offer the diff or to compact things or do other, other things on your behalf. I should also mention that I didn't mention, uh, when a message comes in from the server and I had, you find the interesting parts by um, you know, trial and error. And if somebody else is editing the A character and your FontForge doesn't have the A character, then there are no abstractions in your FontForge for that glyph. So you deserialize the message and it says, hey, you know, we've got glyph with this particular Unicode point um, and I'd like you to update it to have this new circle in it. And there's no window for that, there's no abstraction for that. And you then have to think, you know, how do I create these and how do I make sure that I've got one unique A character that has come in? So you need to worry about your program state and making sure that your program be able to create the new windows and the new abstractions in the program to handle the data coming in. Um, otherwise, you know, if someone starts a new glyph and you don't have that glyph, you won't see it. So it's not, um, you know, rocket science end of the world stuff, but um, there are little areas like that where you have to handle the fact that somebody's doing something that your local copy doesn't have memory abstractions for at the moment. Yes, less screen saver aggressiveness, that would be good. Um, yeah, so basically I was thinking of possibly moving a bunch of code, like maybe a thousand or two thousand lines out into a, a collaboration library. Um, and one of the big things would be if it could be integrated with GTK or QT or something like that. So then, you know, if an app knows how to do undo, all of a sudden I can sort of, you know, get in the side there and uh, say, that's great. Now I can use you for collaboration as well. Uh, but I haven't really looked at doing that yet. And, uh, well, you know, if anyone's into that or, uh, you know, knows people at Trolltech or whoever happens to own QT these days, uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's another story. I think that is actually effectively the last slide. So, questions and heckles?